And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Trolling World Logic for the 26th of March 2016. Uh, just to all the usual announcements, we do take live calls during the course of the show tonight at the Skype contact Trolling World Logic. Send us a PM and we'll add you in due course. Please don't call the show, uh, so we'll just uh, dis distract us. We will add you to the call in due time. So, so just, just with all that out the way, it's a pretty depleted panel uh, tonight, but all the introductions. Uh, Marty, what's happening? Um, I had some connection problems, but yeah. <laughs> it looks like it's working now. Yeah, oh, and just uh, one quick announcement. Uh, there was problems setting up the YouTube stream. I just couldn't get my head around what was going on, so it is one only tonight, so just a few issues, but I think we're okay now. Anyway, I'll quickly jump over, and Kitch, how are you doing? Uh, fantastic. I'm fully uh, back from the sun. <laughs> we can see that. An Irish man in the sun, you, you know what the results are. <laughs> so, Kitch, uh, you're here to introduce our special guest tonight. Uh, yes, uh, our guest tonight is Dr. and I'm really sorry because I know I'm going to pronounce this badly. <laughs> Dr. Shana Panta S. Prakash. He received his bachelor's degree in agriculture and a master's in genetics, and he received a PhD in forestry slash genetics from the Australian National University. He's a professor of plant genetics and for plant genetics, biotechnology and genomics at Tuskegee University, where he researches gene improvement research on food crops. Sorry, I'm literally just scratch everything down. So uh, he served in the USDA Agricultural Biotechnology and is part of the advisory committee. And he was a part of the advisory committee into the Department of Biotech in India. He's in, he has been instrumental in catalyzing the scientific community in many countries to be more proactive in the area of biotechnology. And his website, Biotech, provides important information and promotes discussion of ag, uh, ag biotechnology among scientists, policymakers, activists, and journalists. And um, it's welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be good to be with you. Uh, and Kitch will let you start with the introductory questions. Mm -hmm. Alright, so um, I think pretty st standard for question that we usually do at for first is what? How did you get involved in uh, the area that uh, you are researching? Oh, see, so, yeah, I, I was trained uh, primarily as a plant breeder, um, where uh, we have used many traditional tools. In, uh, in genetics to help uh, develop new varieties of crop plants. And in the mid eighties, when I was doing my PhD, um, you know, the biotechnology came along and then I, this was logical for a lot of us who were working in, the, in, in plant breeding to start learning about the new tools in biotechnology, which is primarily starting with plant tissue culture and then introduction of the genes into crop plants because it was one of the new, we primarily see saw it and still do as a, a, a just an additional tool in developing new crop plants and quite excited about it at the time. And, uh, and so that's how I came along into using biotechnology um, as a component of my research, but never knew that over time that this would become so controversial as it has become today. And uh, why do you think it has become so controversial? Well, looking back, I believe that the whole controversy has really been simply been orchestrated by uh, groups that have a vested interest in opposing biotechnology because um, as I can, uh, <laughs> as, I, I, as I told earlier, in the beginning, it was not controversial, even in Europe. Uh, for instance, in England in 19, 96, they had a, a tomato that was genetically engineered and uh, it was a tomato puree. It was very clearly labeled as it was genetically modified. And um, uh, this was just, um, uh, you know, it was, in, it was in the supermarket and nobody had any opposition to that. And uh, I think there was a range of factors, again, especially in Europe, how the whole opposition to biotechnology was sown and spread around the world because of a range of factors, I think, it because of the mad cow disease that came along in the late 90s that eroded a lot of trust amongst 
regulators and food safety authorities in the minds of the public. And, um, and also several green groups saw this as a very lucrative target that they can attack and, uh, and then get into the, um, more into the public arena. And also many of the newspapers uh, started sensationalizing uh, biotechnology stories, although many of them were not true. And so I think this is how it got started. And then uh, several uh, food companies uh, started worrying about the negative image of biotechnology that was, that was being painted and started uh, saying that they're not going to be using GMO products in their foods. And so that's how the whole cascade of events that began and uh, that's what we have today is, is the whole controversy about GMO. Yeah, if, if I could jump in there, the, you said a couple of things that I thought sounded very interesting. Uh, first, you mentioned mad cow disease. Uh, yeah, I can sort of understand why people would become more safety conscious because of something like that, because I mean, that was a big deal, but have people been linking that to biotech? or GMOs, or what's that all about? No, There's not really. Yeah, I, they, I don't think they, I mean, there's no relationship between mad cow and no. the GMO, and people have, people are not linked to it. But the point is the GMOs were being introduced into our food chain in the middle of 90s when the mad cow disease also oh. made its entry. And so what is what I'm saying is the same people uh, who are saying that there was no uh, risk of mad cow disease. Uh, when, especially in England, for instance, uh, you had a, a, an agri agriculture minister who was reassuring the public that English beef is safe. If you eat it, you're not going to get any mad cow. And he famously ate a hamburger and fed it to his child in, on, on television. And later, it was proven that mad cow could be transmitted from cows to humans. And so what I'm trying to say is that the whole trust about the food safety authorities and about the regulators were eroded. And it was the same regulators and the food safety authorities were saying, hey, now GMOs are safe. You have nothing to worry about. You see, and so it was in that climate of erosion of trust in GMOs. Okay. Yeah, that cleared that up. Uh, another thing you mentioned was uh, groups were honesty, but it's just. The groups such as Greenpeace is a famous example. Yeah. And Greenpeace traditionally, as you know, in the mid 80s, there was the Rainbow Warrior and their main uh, campaign was against uh, the nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear plants and the nuclear weapons. And then, of course, they started attacking the GMO. They started beginning to attack the GMOs and the, the Green Party in West Germany and some of the green groups in Europe also started uh, campaigning against the GMO, primarily again, uh, because they, you know this was a new area. And I, I do believe it's lucrative in the sense because many of these groups also had to raise money and uh, starting attacking to GMOs uh, as an unsafe food. And also uh, it was something mm, being introduced through corporations, mainly American corporations, was also good for fundraising and also politically mm -hmm. very appealing for many of these groups. Yeah, because they have political goals as well. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of anti-authority sort of policies, mm -hmm. I guess. Certainly. And, um, you know, in 1999, there was a, a big World Trade Organization uh, summit and many countries from around the world gathered in Seattle here in the United States. And, um, and that was one of the very first uh, huge events where a lot of activists who were opposed to the trade, who were opposed to globalization showed up. And it was a very messy affair and I was there too. There were tear gases and, and it was covered by the worldwide media. 
And one of the one of the campaigns uh, that was being waged against WTO was also against the new GMOs that were being introduced. And so I think that was one of the very first time where it became a global phenomenon, the anti-GMO campaign. And it was very highly, very widely covered in the news, mainly because of the uh, high prominence of the WTO meeting and the, the theatrical elements that one could see with the tear gas and, and everything in the sea, streets of Seattle at that time. Okay. Uh, I'll just take this moment to introduce our late co-host, Pumpkin. Hi there. Uh, hi. Hello. Howdy, doctor. Coming through very faint, Pumpkin. <laughs> All right, anyway, we'll uh, just carry on. There was a question that came in through the chat room, and it's guest mm -hmm. nine. 9159, lots of other numbers. I see it there. Yep. I see it there. Uh, what can, uh, so I'll ask it because what can scientists do to change the discussion around GMOs? Sorry, say that again. I Sorry, didn't get that um, what can scientists do to change the discussion around GMOs? Right. I think scientists, especially scientists in the academia, I you know, and in. The academic uh, and the public sector uh, do have a very large responsibility, uh, those who work in the GM, those who understand, to provide a more science-based and reason-based and evidence-based information into the debate and to inject themselves and to, to, to inform the public as to what, what kind of tests go in into making sure that these GMOs are safe and then to put this in the whole context. Because one of the, the 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 most important questions that I get asked all the time is, how can you assure me that, that these GMOs are safe, and uh, and then how how can you assure me that in the long run nothing is going to happen to me if I eat these GMOs? And so there's a lot of a lot of doubts in public's minds about the safety of GMO, and scientists, and especially those scientists who are working in genetics, and uh, and use genetics in their research and understand this whole area of GMO um, need to step into the public arena and help explain in a manner that people can understand what this whole um, GMO technology is all about. And to put it in the context, in the long history of many genetic techniques that we have used to breed our crop plants or livestock, you see we've been using hybridization, we've been crossing our crop plants with wild, wild species uh, we've been using mutagenesis like irradiation and chemicals to bring about changes in our crop plants. And uh, in those long line of the techniques that we've used in the past 30 years, we have begun to use this gene transfer technology. And uh, in, the, in, in more harder techniques now and probably going to be more prominent in the future is a, a new technique called gene editing, also called as CRISPR-Cas9 technology which helps us to not introduce any foreign genes into crop plants, but essentially edit the genes that are already in, in the crop plants so as to develop uh, new varieties through very fine tuning of the genome sequences. Hey, um, right, well, sorry, I'll just check again. Pumpkin, can you hear us now? Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's a lot better. <laughs> All right, uh, Kirch, I'll let you jump in with a if you have a response to that, because this is kind of more your area, that. Kitch, do you hear me? Muted. You're muted, Kitch. Yeah. Yep, okay. yeah, the old uh, classic never fails. All right, Kitch, yes, you have a point how, there. How do I technology? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, but that's on the issue of science communication. It's There are scientists that actually are out um correct and misinformation on the inf on the issue of the gmo crops but you may notice that there is a lot of negativity they get back online on due negativity just as uh, just as a recent example kevin Fulte and it, what happened with him um just all the nasty stuff he gets online do you find that that that's what you get when you uh 
to uh, promote genetic uh, modification? Yes, to a certain extent, but Kevin Folta, uh, the one you're talking about is a, a professor at the University of Florida and a, a really an amazing uh, science communicator who has been at the forefront in talking about GMOs. But I think Kevin, Kevin has got his more than his share of attacks primarily because I think he's he is far more active and he's far more present in some of the forums like Reddit and and he gets into a lot of these online discussion groups and he probably gets uh, gets more criticism than uh, uh, and then the kind of confrontation than I would normally get into. But nevertheless, it is fairly common and uh, you know, I think you all know that internet is a really nasty place, especially in terms of the as a public uh, public discussion forum, because people can get, um, you know, the attacks can get very intense and personal, and so. But as a as in as, it, and this is not unique to the issue of GMOs. And anybody who has looked at the comments on YouTube, for instance, will will notice that. But nevertheless, well, we're all very familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you are, uh, and we are too. But nevertheless, um, uh, and Kevin has also been very gracious in this as to how he has handled it, and in in trying to change a lot of minds by showing that you don't need to get you know you don't need to get embroiled in uh, uh, name calling and a lot of nasty um, discourse that we see. But as long as we limit limit our discussion to science. And reason, uh, and, and and so he he I think he has done a gr great job in, in trying to convince a lot of people that and you could you could engage in a civil discussion and even while talking about very controversial issues, you don't have to agree with each other, but we can always respect uh, you know each other's um, each other's opinion and to, to and we can always agree to disagree. Uh, related to that, uh, in, Kitch asked about scientists. Um, what would you say is the role of science educators in all this? I think science educators have a, a very big role to play in any area of which gets into the public arena, and it's not and the science is very nuanced and complex. It's very easy for those who who have a vested interest to 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 to, to make it more emotional. So the lot of issues. It's not just GMO, for instance, climate change, for instance. And uh, as science educators have a very important role to bring the science into the public space and in a manner that the people can understand. Um, even if there are very complex issues, science educators. Uh, with their training, with their knowledge of science, but also with their ability to communicate, should be able to bring it and help help uh, the person on the street understand many of the issues without having to get get into too much technical, without having to use too many jargons. And not all of us are capable of. I mean, not all scientists are able to do a good job, and so science educators can tread the middle line in helping bring the message to the public. Yeah, that, that's my experience as well. There are great scientists who know, uh, you know, well, if, if it wasn't obvious, I am a, a, um, a physics teacher. Uh, so it's not my, I, I'm, in, I'm involved in science education, even if it's a different science. Uh, but uh, I, I, I get this impression a lot that there are many scientists who are really great at what they do and they know a lot more than I do, but they can't communicate it because they always put everything at a at a level that assumes that they're at least talking to an undergraduate. Right. Um, if they're talking to a complete lay person and that's what they have to do, then it, it just goes straight over their head and it, it just sounds like complete gibberish. And then you get the whole, oh, that's just jargon you're throwing out there to hide your dishonesty behind words I don't understand or blah, blah, blah. So I, exactly. I, I think I think uh, science education is very important in that uh, in that regard. Certainly, it's, I think you made a very important point. Uh, you know, there's so much of uh, everyday life of what we do today is 
uh, has been improved because of science. Now that you know we we are in different continents and we are talking in real time is really an amazing testimony to science. And we know today more than ever in the history of humanity, every minute of what we do has has been impacted by science. And the, one of the biggest uh, biggest innovations that has come along, for instance, is the use of mobile phone technology. Uh, I am originally from India when I go back home. And I see even some of the poorest of the poor you know, use this mobile phone technology in a very meaningful manner. Uh, and as so much has to, it has improved the quality of their life in many ways. And uh, we are living longer, we are living better, and even in many developing countries, and it's all because of science. And of course, science is also, or the use of science, the technological use can also has been misused, like we see it very clearly. Uh, in when we just have to turn on the news that we can see how this is being misused, but also the negative impact of many of the scientific innovations. Uh, you can name me any innovations and I can tell, you know, there's going to be a great benefit, but there is also certain cost associated with it. And genetic engineering and the use of GMOs in, in crops, perhaps uh, to a certain extent is a good example of that, of where I see there's been great benefit from the use of GMOs. Uh, we see there has been an increased income for many of the farmers who grow these GM crops. There has been a decrease of pesticides. For instance, in India, where they grow BT cotton, 99% um, of the Indian farmers have embraced this technology, even though the, the, the cost of the seeds is little higher, clearly because it has helped uh, bring more profit to their operation, but also cut down the amount of pesticides. And we have many GM crops in development that can help with the impending dangers of global warming and through the climate resilient crops. And we also have crops in development um, that can bring greater nutrition, uh, dietary nutrition to the people. And so there's a great, great benefit from the use of this technology. And there may be small associated risks. And what a good science educator would do is to, to lay it out on the table and show and talk about how that when, when we move, move forward, that we are going to have uh, both positive and negative consequences of this technology. But as if people are more well informed, then they are able to make better decisions in a manner that how we can, they can harness the benefits of this technology while keeping some other problem to a bare minimum. Okay, um, Pumpkin, you can come in. You had the chat room question ready to go there. Uh, question here from Peachy King 80. With the new modification methods in the news more, such as CRISPR, Cas9, mm -hmm. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. No, that's, uh, that's very good. Oh, yeah. I thought it was going to be some weird scientific. Anyway. Uh, do you think that will change how the public perceives genetic modifications, particularly in regards to GMO crops? Right. And I, I hope so. And I do think with the um, advent of some of this technology, what you're talking about CRISPR-Cas9 is, is the gene editing technology, which is a, again moving the, away from the traditional GMOs, which in, involved introduction of foreign genes into crop plants is where now we're going to move into the using the new techniques where we simply um, make small minor targeted changes into the plant genome so that there is not going to be any foreign genes into that. I think if you are very honest about this in a manner if we go about, this will help increase public acceptance of this technology. But some of the groups who are opposed to this technology are still not going to relent about it because they still believe this is going to be genetic engineering. This still is going to be primarily in the hands of big multinational companies. And so some of those critics who are, who are against this GMO technology, not because of safety, but because of some of the larger socio-political reasons, uh, I don't think you are they are going to be accepting this, whether it is GM or gene editing. But overall, I do believe in the general public. If we make a good attempt to help explain what the new technology is about, 
and how this is a, a much better refinement of some of the traditional uh, older GMO technologies, it might lead to a more societal acceptance of the new biotechnologies. Um, I'm curious if, in your eyes, uh, the higher prevalence of um, hatred for GMOs, specifically in more developed areas, do you think that's down simply to the fact that people have the option of hating that and getting away with it, as opposed to in areas, as you have mentioned many times, India, the more rural, uh, less developed areas, where they simply, it's less of a simple choice. Um, do you think it's sort of Western, more developed influences pushing on? Yes, I think it's to a certain, to a large extent, you're right, because much of the opposition to this, for instance, is for seeds coming from Europe, where many of the many of the people, the experts, you know, are of the wrong opinion. They don't necessarily need biotechnology, and right now that might be true because Europe already has very high food production, and, and, and you don't see many starving uh, people in Europe. And so they, while Europe deliberately and willingly, they do accept biotechnology, for instance, in medicine and in many other areas, they're not really accepting biotechnology in crops because of that reason. But on the other hand, when, when you look at India or say Bangladesh or many other developing countries where uh, and a typical family spends about 80% of their income on the food and where a, a, a failure of the harvest, like what's happening right now in southern African countries, which with a very serious drought and where there's an impending famine. And when you see when we have these technologies that are able to help prevent some of those, it, clearly there's a greater relevance of uh, agricultural biotechnologies in many of the developing countries simply because they have a greater problem with food and with all this climate change scenarios, they're going to have even more dire problems, uh, problem with the food. And um, you, you don't see many people protesting against biotechnology in the, in the streets of uh, uh, Nairobi or Dhaka, uh, like we want, what we would see in, in the US or Europe. Okay. So it is, I think it is mainly a first world, first world problem that is being imposed on the third world. Uh, guys, can you carry on with the questions? We do have a caller lined up, so I'm just going to sort them out and add them into the call. So one of you guys can carry on the conversation. Sure. Okay. Um, there was a yes, question will... here in the in the chat room. I don't know if that was mentioned uh, with new modification methods in the news more, such as yeah, that, that's, 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 that's yeah, that's that's that you were talking about. It. Yeah. Never mind. Um, it, it does. It does seem to be. It, it, it is a very much a first world issue. This whole controversy of genetic modification, um, even among. But, though the the one thing I, I I'm glad that I haven't really seen is uh, unlike vaccine denialism, or other forms of denialism, activists haven't gone over. To these foreign countries, um, to 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 to, to uh, third world countries, to start kind of promoting this um, denialism or this pseudoscience. I'm not sure what the best way to to, to describe describe it as. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, like, say, vaccine denialism, or even worse, the uh, AIDS denialism, which happened in South Africa? Do you think Absolutely. that's because they 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 they're, know that they're not going to get much of a, a victory, there's not much point going over there, or do they don't really care about these countries, or is it because, or have they tried, that they just haven't been as successful? Yeah, it's very hard for me to understand the opposition to, to any of this, you know, whether it's vaccine or even how the whole, um, whole age denialism, denialism that came about because of a few mavericks scientists in the West. In this case, it was Professor Duisberg and, uh, in UC Berkeley, who was very well known for his stance saying that HIV does not cause AIDS. And what we're saying, what you're referring to here is a famous case, the South African government, especially the health minister, 
said that the South Africa doesn't have to invest in many of the HIV treatments, and they start and they famously ask their HIV the AIDS patients to eat garlic and onion, saying that that would help cure the AIDS. And literally, uh, tens of thousands of South Africans died because of that. And so this is, shows how embracing the junk science, as especially when you are relying on public policy in crafting your public policy can lead to very disastrous consequences. And we have a lot of a lot of historical um, anecdotes for that, you know, historical uh, evidence for that. Uh, Soviet Union in the 30s famously denied genetics as a science, and they put many of the crop geneticists in prison. And one of the very famous uh, scientists for, at that time, for Vavilov, who who came up with the concept of biodiversity and the crop uh, origin in many different places as to how each crop has an origin in different parts of the world, was put in prison and uh, ironically died of starvation. And so it's very easy for some of the groups who are opposed to these technologies for whatever vested interest that they have uh, for them to do that. But one needs to be cognizant or one needs to be aware of what happens when you deny these technologies to those who need most. A good example uh, right now is golden rice, and many people know what golden rice is. It is a, a, a rice with enriched vitamin A or pro-vitamin A content because of a couple of maize or corn genes that have been put into it. You see, the problem is there's a very high vitamin A deficiency in many parts of the developing world, and this vitamin A deficiency causes something like half a million children to go blind every year, which is a very, very uh, unfortunate uh, situation because of lack of vitamin A in their diet. And uh, most of these people eat rice. And uh, there are about 120, 130,000 varieties of rice in the world. And not a single one has any vitamin A or pro-vitamin A in the grain. And so this golden rice for the first time is able to deliver uh, the required amounts of uh, precursor to vitamin A, the beta carotene, into the diet, so much so that if, if this becomes popular, we would be able to practically eliminate the vitamin A deficiency from rice-eating parts of the world, especially in Asia. And although this technology was developed 20 years ago, it is still sitting on the shelf, primarily because of opposition to GMO technologies and, and all the fears that has been whipped up against this so much so that many developing countries who could benefit from the technology, what they have done today is to simply put many barriers against accepting this technology through regulation and, 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 and policies that are not very enabling. Okay, I think we have to call her in. Yeah, uh, call her, are you there? Hello, call her. Say something. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, caller. Can you hear us? No, we're not having any luck there. We can't hear. How about any. now? Oh, yep. How there. About now? Yeah, there yeah. you are. We've got you now. Okay. Well. Hey. Okay. Um. Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm just going to call you Van because I'm not going to pronounce the whole name. But uh, you're okay. on with uh, Doctor <laughs> Prakash. So ask your question. Hi, Prakash. This is Alison Van Inanum from UC Davis calling uh, from hi, California. Alison. Hey, so how are you doing? Nice. Um, so I guess my question, Prakash, is that, you know, we've been putting the science out there for 20 years and the majority of people consider this technology unsafe. Um, they listen to people like Jeffrey Smith and we've even got legislatures who say that the seeds of deception is their Bible. I, I would say we haven't we haven't done a good job of getting our information out there. And what can we do differently to change the discourse? Oh, thank you, Alison. Um, I don't know. I think you are one of the, the you know global experts in in biotechnology, and you've done such a great job uh, from the University of California Davis to to bring an awareness the awareness of this technology to people. In a in a such a, a elegant manner, it's it, it's a it's our do, our job is made more difficult because uh, of uh, like individuals that you mentioned Jeffrey Smith, who is not a scientist, 
and who is not an expert, and yet he goes around the world in a denigrating this technology and creating in the the fears in the minds of people, and that makes it very difficult. And uh, I really um, think you know we need to be we need to have more science communicators like yourself who need to be out in the open and talking about talking about the usefulness of biotechnology. But also, I think we need to have some products in the market that people can relate to and they can see, and uh, like Gordon Rice, for instance, and that would help uh, help change the, change the minds of the uh, public. And we also need to see how we can bring greater acceptance, acceptance of this technology in Europe, because I think Europe is the epicenter of the opposition to this technology and because so many European countries are opposed to this and they have such a direct influence on uh, countries such as in Africa, uh, if we try to bring about a change in the Europe, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to bring about a change in the rest of the world. So I, 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 I still don't have any good answers uh, <laughs> how, we can, how we can do a better job, but I, I think not trying is definitely not the answer. And that's how some of the critics are trying to do by trying to silence us. I definitely feel it's also in the hands of probably to be earned some of our listeners out there who are, act or are passionate about science to help spread the good science um, around. Right. The more people that are actively reading, promoting the good science, countering the bad science, the easier it will be to to, to trump and to trump these. Uh, Absolutely. These, yeah. I agree uh, because uh, I think it's too important to the science of genetics and genetic engineering is too important to be left to scientists alone. So I think when we have more citizen science activists that are pro-science that we are seeing in the last few years, especially in the social media. I think that would help bring about a change in the mindset, um, specifically young people. Because a lot of the disinformation comes from social media. Absolutely. Uh, social media is very rife uh, with misinformation. And if you just put, for instance, GMO into the search box of Google, uh, you get all kinds of nonsense yeah. uh, that has been perpetuated against this technology. And, uh, and so it is not surprising that most people have such a slanted view of what it is and what it can be done. But on the other hand, it is a, a challenging task for a lot of us to see how we can try to, to bring about the, the real possibilities, the fantastic possibilities that how it could, the, what this technology can do to help bring, uh, bring about great benefits to the world, especially the developing world. I definitely think social media is 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 actively promoting the bad science because it's easier to share a meme, a, a bad science meme, rather to think about it critically. I agree, so, and it's it's with anything, you know, if it's like then it's when the news, what we say is safe, it's very bland, but on the other hand, it's very easy to sensationalize and emotion uh, bring an element of scare into this and that makes it far more uh, popular and accepting and it's very natural for people, especially young people, to be um, um, skeptical of uh, authorities and skeptical of the establishment and so they do see this technology as being a product of the establishment and that is one of the reasons why we have uh, opposition to this technology, especially among the young minds. I think that's why uh, events like biohacking, I know there's a biohackers uh, space in Manchester. I'm not too sure about yeah. elsewhere if it's picked up popularity, but it's a really good way of getting the people in, showing them the science, showing exactly what, how you would go about modifying an organism and getting them to do their own experiments. It, it, it seems like that'd be a really good way of hands-on education. I agree. Um, any other questions there? 
From me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's been interesting. I'm not sure if you saw there's a, a an anti-vaccine movie that's been submitted oh, yeah. to, I think, the Tribeca Festival. Yeah. And it's been kind of in, heartening to see the response on social media to that. And it's interesting that we haven't had a similar response around GMOs when equally preposterous movies have come out. Um, and we don't, we seem to have kind of this spiral of silence around this particular topic where people are hesitant to, to speak up about it. And I think part of it is there's, there's many different aspects that people are worried about, maybe herbicide use, maybe the toxicity of Roundup, maybe multinational corporations. And so depending upon what little aspect of, of GMOs people are worried about, we just don't seem to have that solidified voice speaking out in, in, in for the possibilities of this breeding method to actually solve problems in agriculture. And why don't we have that unified voice that you're seeing now when you have you know stuff like the, the anti-vaxxer movie come out where you're actually seeing the scientists come together and, and be quite effective, I think. That's true. Uh, what? I'm sorry. One thing that uh, that uh, I noticed recently was that uh, someone who is supporting GMOs is uh, Bill Nye. I mean, he, right. he, granted, he's not uh, involved in that field, but he is a well-known science communicator. So that right. has to be a, a, at least a small victory. Yeah, he was against them, or yeah. at least. Um, you know, skeptical, and I think that he has changed his opinion, and uh, you know, he let the evidence change his mind, which is kind yeah. of the definition of science, right? So yeah. that was a that was a positive. Yeah, but right. Then, uh, also, other science uh, communicators, uh, very high-profile science communicator communicators like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is very popular, also along with Bill Nye, is also very pro-GMO, and so we yeah. need lot more. Uh, spokespersons of, uh, you know, they may not have, they may not be scientists, but they may have high credibility and they are very much in the, in the, in the public uh, at the arena. And if they come and start speaking in, in, in support of this technology, that was also help, help change the mind. But one more thing, compared to vaccine or global climate change, the GMO, uh, uh, in contrast, there is not much greater understanding of this or acceptance of this from the public, primarily because, you see, we, we, we all have uh, experienced, you know, we have taken vaccinations, we have been immunized, so we have personal familiarity with it. And that's how we also have, we see the global climate thing because we can re easily relate to the climate. But I personally believe most people would not be able to relate to what's happening in the field of agriculture, oh. especially plant breeding. There is much ignorance about it, and that's what uh, is responsible uh, as to why so much misinformation has gone into into those, those minds uh, in the absence of uh, uh, credible, credible inf information and lack of good understanding of what the whole area is agriculture and how it is evolved. Uh, so, um, anything else here, caller? No. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, th thanks very much for your Thank call. You. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and guys, you can carry on there if you have any questions. Right, I, I'm gonna. Well, I'll take one up there. Um. And it's like quite a good thing that do you think that actually maybe another per, other, another group of people we should be lobbying and trying to get on the side of GMOs is celebrities, just ordinary right. celebrities. Do you think because, you know, they're pointing out in the chat room, there's that recent, the Andrew Wakefield documentary that's just been released and Robert De Niro is a big supporter and that's going to make a cause. I mean, do you think that could make a big difference? I think so. Any time when we have, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about the Hollywood celebrities, but anyone who is trusted, whose voice is trusted, uh, would help bring about this discussion. And when they keep, when they start talking about how this is a, 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 a science that could be of help to the humanity, and this is a tool that we could 
in, in, you know, with uh, under checks and balances with the system of regulation that we have, can be safely deployed to make about bring about new benefits, new variations, and new benefits uh, would clearly help. For instance, you see, in the late 90s, there was a, a scare against one uh, chemical that was used on Apple called LR. Uh, this, you know, Apple farmers used to spray this chemical. Uh, as a way to haze on ripening and bring about ripening. And there was a, a, a television story, story from 60 Minutes, CBS 60 Minutes, saying that it may be carcinogenic. And there was many, a couple of Bollywood, uh, may, couple of Hollywood actors who were involved in saying that. And so there was a lot of scare and people, you know, the, the Apple, um, the consumption of apples came down and there was a lot of scare. And the Apple industry was clearly worried. But then the Surgeon General at that time, for Everett Cook, who was very popular here in the United States because he, he waged a very strong campaign against smoking, and he was very highly popular, came, came on television and said, look, this LR is safe and you can eat apples. It's not going to hurt you. And there is no scientific basis that that use of that particular chemical causes any cancer, and then the whole controversy immediately dissipated. So what I'm trying to say here is so when we have high profile uh, individuals who are highly respected in the society, and if they come up, come aboard and start talking positively about this technology or any technology, and that will also help in greater acceptance uh, in the minds of the public, because a lot of times public doesn't want to know the whole science behind it because if you see there is also this question in the minds of people about how mobile phones can cause cancer right and so a lot of times i don't as a, a lay person in, in in that field i don't necessarily need to understand all the science behind it but i just want an assurance from somebody who understands to tell me to say that it is safe and so that would also help in, in uh, with the whole GMO controversy here. Well, is it is not, um, at least in my interactions with the people who are so vehemently against GMOs, a lot of them are uh, very heavily conspiracy. Con they're just conspiracy notes. There's no nice way to put it. They That's think correct. that yeah. the government is out to get them, that uh, the NASA's fake, that all of this crazy nonsense and no matter how many uh, intelligent well-respected people turn around and say it's safe don't worry about it they say no that's part of the conspiracy does it that's ever right. do you think it'll ever get to the stage where and i realize that the most hardline of those people are just almost beyond help but do you think that it'll ever get to the stage where people just say oh yeah it's fine yeah, I, I think so. You know, a lot, lot of times, many of these uh, controversies have a sh certain shelf life, and people, you know, now don't question about Apollo Apollo landing on the moon as much as they, or the you know the controversy was that about, about that a few years ago, and uh, hopefully this, if it is really, the, the controversy is due to those kinds of doubts, and uh, over time people will come to their senses and they move on. And I hope that will happen with this technology too. And I think it's some of the same people who believe in conspiracy theories, trying to, to promote this, uh, their point of view on this technology. And hopefully they'll move on and find new conspiracy to, to, to feed their fears. And the one simple answer to all those conspiracy buffs is, yeah, it's the same government that you are afraid of bringing in this technology was not able to hack a simple iPhone or get you know <laughs> in the in the in this recently in the case of uh, uh, with the San Bernardino terrorist the mighty United States government could not get onto the uh, and put pressure on the Apple Apple computer Apple. Um, if memory serves me, that story they um... so, so you know there's only so much. The, the, the governments can do and so when, when you look into the reality of everything uh, then you one, one, one will see 
that whether it's a government or the corporations, you can only have that conspiracy to hide away, uh, hide from the people if there's any reality for only so long. There's always going to be somebody who's going to come out uh, and, and, sh and show what the truth is. And in this case, 99% uh, of the scientists who are working in the GMO uh, say that this is a safe technology. And we have about 2,200 research papers uh, that have looked at the safety of this and they have come about very clearly saying that this is safe. They can't find anything, any problem with it. And so um, most of them can't be wrong. Yeah, there's always seems to be someone making a profit when there's a conspiracy, but it's usually not who the conspiracy is about. That's true. And historically, there's always been, you know, when you see opposition to certain things, there's always a vested interest behind it, an economic interest. Uh, you know, up until 1930s, apparently in London, uh, used to have gas lamps in the streets, although in most other uh, countries that had gotten away with it. They had electric lamps simply because of the, I think, with the gas industry lobby. And so, and that's that's what happened when, when you bring in new technologies and new innovation, there's always going to be somebody who's going to be affected by that and they're going to resist it. The idea that uh, big pharma is coming to get you, by the way, have some healing crystals. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, guys, any other questions there? Some chat room questions, so Pumpkin. Yeah, I saw that. Pumpkin, okay. you take away the chat room questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, the ah, Mitch Keen, 80, again. Uh, changing public opinion is important, but how do we overcome the problem of politicians having little to no science knowledge and then making laws affecting science? We see these issues popping up with food labels, vaccines, climate change, etc. Yeah, I think that uh, that is far more difficult when you're working in politics. But again, uh, when when you're working with politics, if you are able to show that public opinion uh, in the long, uh, you know, in their constituencies tend to favor certain policies, pol politicians always tend to to look more carefully as to how how their constituents look at these issues. And so, to bring about a change in the mind of politicians, we need to bring about a change in the minds of the public. That's easier said than done. But I think when we have a much educated public, when we have a much uh, accepting science, accepting public, then those public will also get the kind of politicians that they deserve. All right, Pumpkin, there's uh, another chat room question there. I thought there was. No, oh, no. there is not. No, there isn't. Sorry, my mistake there. Uh, guys, do you have any other questions there? No, am I transmitting at all? Yeah, you are. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of things. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> there is I one kind of. I think, uh, sorry, I'll just say there's one very basic question. I think this is kind of for all. What actually is biotech, basically? Because, uh, you know, a lot of people even have work difficulty with that word because they, right. they think of biotech and you're growing a fish with you know, human arms and th weird things like that. So <laughs> what exactly is biotech? You read my latest paper. <laughs> <laughs> the secret I catch. Right. We saw the experiments in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> I know. A biotechnology means different things to different people. You know, one could also define biotechnology in a very broad sense that a lot of things we have been using for thousands of years with use of any biological organisms to help the humanity can be termed biotechnology in a very broad sense. But more, the, the kind of biotechnology we're talking about now is really the use of genetic engineering. When there is a recombinant DNA, uh, specifically uh, trying to modify the DNA, uh, bringing about a change in the organism by trying to change the DNA sequence is what the biotechnology is, that we are talking about and is what the controversial 
aspect of biotechnology. But again, by the same definition, uh, when we move into some of the, the newer uh, techniques of biotechnology that we discussed early on, like CRISPR, does not involve transfer of foreign genes from various sources. Uh, other th so, so in other words, uh, I know Greenpeace has made a big hay of putting a, a fish gene into the strawberry and, uh, you know, the icon of biotechnology comes to people's mind is, is Frankensteinian tomatoes or, or strawberry with animal genes in them is not going to be the stuff of many of the future crop breeding that we are talking about. This is going to be much more fine-tuned, small changes within the genome without involving any transfer of foreign genes. And that's where much of the future biotechnology is going to be. Um, I've always thought uh, in the back of my mind, it always seems, like going back to the question I had earlier about uh, the whole first world problems becoming problems for the entire world. Uh, do right. you think if there was to be a product that just appealed to first world, the, the first world in general, like, um, I'm trying to think, like corn that tasted like chocolate or something like that, <laughs> something that was right something that's yeah. just it has no nutritional benefit but it's just nice it's something <laughs> do you think that would progress things or would it just be like just another shiny thing to put on the mantle well uh, anything that would help bring about a, a a positive view of this technology in the minds of the public especially in the first world would be helpful, you know, because much of the research is really in the first world, you know, Europe and United States were the pioneers in, in developing this technology. And they are using this technology to a great benefit in so many areas. 90% uh, of all the drugs in the clinical trial today are have been developed through biotechnology. And so we have many, many new fascinating uh, products that are being developed through biotechnology. And so what we really need to do is to tell a better story uh, of how this science, if it's allowed to flourish, is going to help us to live better, live longer, and also take better care of the environment. And then try to convince the public through, through good science and through better products is, is what is going to help us in the long run. And uh, first word, uh, one good example would be as to how uh, in Europe, for instance, in about 100 years ago, all the, the grapes in France were completely threatened with a, a nematode, a, a, a nasty pest. And all the, every grape that has been planted today in France uh, is resting on the rootstock of what they got from uh, grape wines they got from California. In other words, uh, what I'm trying to say here is the first world has the wherewithal to use this technology if there is a, if some of their products are threatened. See what I mean? If there is a, a threat to the, the food security in the first world, if there is a threat to the a new potato disease or a new wheat disease that is going to help, uh, that is going to destroy our crop, then there is going, and if the biotechnology will rescue it, this will be seen in a more positive light. And I'm not, I'm not asking for that, but historically it, it, we have seen uh, when any society that is, uh, you know, that has its priorities would be rearranged if there is a, a if there are new threats coming along. And for the third world, right now, feeding its people is going to be is the most important priority. And having trying to accept any technologies that would help them to do a better job of that, they are going to be receptive to that more than the first world. I, I just think that Pumpkin brought up a very good idea here. Uh, if, if we as <laughs> yeah, I said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm it, so surprised. You think it, <laughs> if we assume then that that there is no new threat coming, and you know what what is it that drives people in the first world? Well, it's basically increased comfort, increased pleasure. 
Right. And, and so it make the food taste better. That, that, that would be just a, a great thing to do. I mean, granted, it's not going to save lives, but it might make people like this technology more. Um, and then second. you could save lives. One major thing before we continue, um, Dr. Prakash, you did say earlier uh, about a potential new potato disease. Myself and Kitch are Irish. Please don't don't scare us like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know, I know, I, I know it too well uh, because I talk about that in in my class, and there is always you know potato in Ireland was the most famous case, but. We have threats all the time. Right now, uh, there is a new rust disease that is threatening the wheat and our uh, and uh, bananas. You know, we can't we can't breed bananas because they don't have seeds. And bananas are very important in African diet. And but there is a, there are two diseases that are threatening banana, and it can you know it can potentially be wiped out. And so we we must be on guard. And we had a beautiful. Uh, uh, tree, chestnut uh, tree, there were about 4 billion of them in the United States and all of them were wiped out. And uh, so are the M trees in the Europe. And there's always a new threat with disease and pests that is going to, that makes our crops and our food very vulnerable. And, uh, we, and having technologies that help us uh, provide a, a, a layer of protection against the threats is something that we cannot take it lightly, and biotechnology is one of them. And is there also, has that also been discussed about using biotechnology in the case of the Zika virus? Mm -hmm. I haven't, I've been trying to catch up on that. Uh, I haven't really right. got a chance to, but it's, I, I have seen that that has been discussed. Certainly. You know, Right, you know, the, this this is a very scary virus, as you know, and it's making such a, a nasty impact because it can affect the, the brain uh, of the, the, the fetus and the children who are born as mothers infected with Zika virus uh, have, uh, have such a, 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 a very sad brain deformity. And one of the most important tools that we have against this virus is an innovation that came from Oxford University in England, where they use the sterile mosquito technique. And by genetically engineering mosquitoes, uh, in a way to make them sterile is to, to bring up, to spread the sterility within the population of those carrying this virus or any virus. It's been shown very effective in trials that they've done with dengue virus, which is another virus also transmitted by mosquitoes. And, um, and I think that's a great, good example that you brought about. Uh, as to how biotechnology can help. And also, uh, an Indian company run by a friend of mine uh, has developed a vaccine, or at least they're in the process of developing a vaccine, and some of their initial results have been very good. And practically all new vaccines against infectious diseases today have been brought about through biotechnology, including how we got rid of, or at least the Ebola threat that we saw in West Africa last year. Believe it or not, all those medicine that helped cure the Ebola uh, last year were all developed in GMO plants, tobacco in Kentucky. That's how they were multiplied, the therapeutic proteins against the Ebola virus. Questions there? See, I'm going to check the chat room. <laughs> oh, here, 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 there are some suggestions for things that should be developed. Um, okay, go ahead. Viagra corn. <laughs> corn for your horn. Yeah. Uh, uh, and someone, th this was actually a good one. Uh, cats that uh, people can't be allergic to. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that, would, right. that would sell. Not, not as well as Viagra corn, though, but... <laughs> yeah, and uh, talking about allergy, uh, you know, that, that's something that's very important, and there are some people who are allergic to peanut, and that can yeah. be deadly to those. And we have uh, many laboratories, including uh, the one that I'm working here at Tuskegee University, where we are trying to develop 
peanuts that are hypoallergenic. Uh, again, using the gene editing technology, and that's a possibility. And as you know, gluten uh, is a big concern um, amongst uh, people who eat wheat. And although it's uh, it's taken a, a, an inordinate amount of proportion, disproportionate to the, the gluten intolerance, but nevertheless, uh, celiac disease is a matter of serious concern to a proportion of people, and there's an allergy to rice, and all of that can be improved use, using biotechnology. We can develop hypoallergenic food that would not be causing allergic uh, reactions like what we see today. Uh, one of my uh, favorite things uh, that I've studied for uh, genetic engineering is potential of using GMO crops as vaccines. Absolutely. So that's some something for that be brilliant for me because I am I hate I I really hate needles. <laughs> so I know if you can come up with an edible vaccine, that's true. But um, I'm for a flu job. Here's a potato. That sounds brilliant. <laughs> uh, there is one thing I wanted to bring up, Doctor Prakash, and we've had some recent experience with this, and this is the whole, you know, the one big elephant in the room that anti-GMO people bring up and that is Monsanto so what's the mm -hmm. scientific community what's their view on Monsanto and the relationship with Monsanto well the, many of the scientists who are working with GMO crops recognize Monsanto as one of the the leading company which has invested a lot of money in developing these technologies they were one of the very first to develop a GMO crop, for instance, way back in the early 80s. And they spend uh, something along like a billion dollars a year on research and development. And many new innovations have come about because of the vast uh, effort uh, into research put in by Monsanto and other companies like Monsanto, such as DuPont, Dow, uh, Bayer, BASF, and Syngenta are some of the few of the handful of companies that are in uh, spending a lot of money researching GMO crops. And so we do recognize this as a, an important company that plays a very significant role. But at the same time, those of us who are working in the public universities do recognize that a lot of crops that we work with, like, like I work with sweet potato on peanut, and there's not much commercial interest in working on this by, by the companies. And even crops such as cassava, a plantain that is eaten in Africa. There's not going to be much interest uh, by companies such as Monsanto to research these crops. So there is great need for public institutions such as universities and national research institutes to be funded so that they could do more of this uh, genetic research and they'll be able to bring about products into the uh, from the public sector where we can't depend on just companies alone to be developing new products in uh, using biotechnology. There is uh, another thing that comes up, and this is a very common claim that the genetic modified crops is that they're just being forced, like they're almost just being rushed through without any checks. I mean, how strict, yes. uh, you know, how uh, vigorous is the process between, you know, you developing in the lab and then you know how many years later it's been planted in a field i mean is there a, i mean is it really checked you know as thoroughly as or as not thoroughly as some people believe absolutely in fact there's far more checks than what is necessary uh, a, a gm uh, crop goes through just the, the testing that for its safety of from, from anywhere from five to eight years and it costs about 120 million dollars uh, for regulatory testing just to satisfy the regulatory requirements for many of uh, uh, for all these crops, and uh, compared in comparison, you don't have absolutely no biosafety regulation at all if you develop a crop by conventional means. In that, it doesn't mean that crops developed by conventional breeding by are, are necessarily safe, but it's just that we we have an inordinate amount of safety testing that goes with GM crops. That, that so those who claim that there's no testing done or there's not enough testing done and that's simply not true. 
this is for the first time we have a tremendous amount of testing that goes on. And you should remember that if I'm trying to develop a, a call, say here in the United States, I not only have to satisfy the regulatory requirements of uh, US uh, regulators such as USDA, EPA or FDA, but also because much of my corn gets exported into other countries such as Europe and China and Japan and South Korea and many of those countries. We also have to ensure that it meets their standards and it meets their regulatory requirements. And so what the, the downside of this is, is, is that because it requires so much testing and because it costs so much to get a biotech crop approved, it has only meant that few handful of companies are have the financial wherewithal to do that. And so when you are trying to say Monsanto, Monsanto all the time, remember by you doing all that, it only has left Monsanto and a few handful of companies in the playing field. Uh, there's no way uh, small universities like the one I work with can come up with $120 million just to have one of my varieties approved. And so that is what has been the result of, uh, of this anti-GMO uh, anti GMO industry, and that has helped mainly big companies now to be in the market. It's, so it's kind of, so, they've almost just, you know, they believe on Santos, but controlling everything and by kind of their uh, paranoia, they're actually <laughs> sort of, you know, creating the very demon they believe in sort of thing. Exactly. And so it's like big pharma and, you know, they call it big ag, and that is true. If it costs about $120 million to, to bring about a new biotechnology crop variety into the market, you're not going to find small specialty crops and vegetables coming out of the market. And it has only meant that, you know, big, big players uh, can afford to do that. Yeah. I also remember those recently, um, I don't know if you heard of this, there was the case at some university and it was... Um, some new variety of banana and they wanted some human test sub well they yeah, wanted some. yeah and it was quite weird because all these people say oh, we don't have enough testing we don't have enough testing they run these right. tests it's completely voluntary and then they went and shut it down which is you know i can't really figure out the thinking behind that right and again you know when golden rice for instance yeah. was being tried in the philippines the the many of these anti-gmo groups they they went and ransacked that field and they destroyed it. And it routinely happens in France and also in Brazil last year. And so you would think that many of these groups who are opposed to biotechnology and claiming for more tests are really not interested in the safety or not interested in the tests. I mean, I mean that would tell you that they just have a vested interest in opposing this technology and you can bring about any amount of tests and proof to show that it is safe and they're not going to be able to be convinced. You, what have you faced any backlash yourself? Because you're, you know, you're quite public on Twitter and the AG Bio World website. Have you faced any kind of negative reactions at all? Have you encountered any? Well, I, 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 I do see some criticisms now and then, but by and large, uh, a lot of my. Uh, the reception to what I say has been very positive, and I don't think I have, you know, encountered much, much negative reaction. I do find a large skeptical public when I when I do give when I give talks in in many of the public forum. I do get a lot of questions, but that's understandable. That comes from a genuine um, curiosity and also stems from lack of knowledge and people want to know more about it, and that is perfectly fine. And Pumpkin, there's another chat room question there. Yep. And just to, let uh, everyone, uh, just to let everyone know, we've got 10 minutes left in the show, so uh, any further questions, fire them in now. So carry on, Pumpkin. Okay, I guessed, dear God, why didn't you just make an account? <laughs> uh, you, okay, I'm just going to rephrase the whole question because it's terrible. 
Do you think something like Arctic apples may improve public view of GMOs? Say they can do Arctic apples. What's about it? Yeah. Uh, do you think that something along the lines of Arctic apples would be used to improve the public view of GMOs? It it helps. Arctic apple is a a, a type of apple developed by a small company in, uh, in British Columbia and Canada, and what it does is they have turned off the gene that uh, the to trade for browning. So when you cut apples up, you will notice that within a few minutes it starts turning brown, and so much of the apple that is uh, cut after a few hours can. You know, you just cannot eat it. And what this Arctic apple they have done is to to reduce the browning when you cut it, and so it remains fresh for a longer time. And uh, and so that could clearly help. And also, there's another company that has developed a similar technology with potatoes, because there is a lot of waste that it goes on in potato uh, industry, and they have uh, turned off the genes related to browning. And also, they have reduced the acrylamide. When potato is, when you make French fries, it secretes a compound called acrylamide, and that is uh, in large amounts can be carcinogenic. And so, they have reduced or uh, eliminated the acrylamide content into this potato. And uh, these two innovations uh, are can in the in the public eyes can can be seen. They, this this is a kind of technology that can relate to you know something unlike something like herbicide resistance or insect resistance that only the farmers can relate to. And this is one of the the traits that public would be able to relate to. And so I I believe this when you bring about products like this, it would help in improving the perception yeah. of what GMO is about in the public eyes. Okay, and we have another chat room question there, Pumpkin. Hey, it looks like I have a job today. <laughs> okay, uh, Soulfire says, can't GMO technology increase crop yield to such an extent that it could feed the world? If so, what would be the consequences for versus the benefits? Uh, that's my question for the nice doctor. <laughs> right. See, so far, uh, many of the, the GM technologies have specifically focused on uh, traits such as uh, herbicide tolerance and insect, insect resistance. And as a consequence of that, they've also increased the yield, but not a great deal because the, the, the intent was not to increase the yield. But we have a lot of research in the pipeline that would directly increase the productivity of crop plants. One good example, is a rice. Uh, rice uh, is is the most important crop that feeds the world, you know, especially in Asia. But it is not very productive because it follows a type of photosynthesis called C3 photosynthesis. But on the other hand, corn and sugarcane are other grasses which have have a better system of photosynthesis called C4 type of photosynthesis. So there's a, a great deal of research going on to see how we can, we can introduce some of the elements of C4 photosynthesis into rice. In that way, we can make the rice more productive. And there are a lot of other research that would help increase our crop yields. We can double or triple the crop yields with many of these increased um, in many of many of these uh, uh, alterations that I'm talking about, and that will help clearly increase the yield in the future. See, as the humanity right now, you know, we are close to about seven billion people, and we'll be nine billion people in uh, in in 15, 20 years time, and we would need every solution to help increase our food production. In the last 30, 40 years, some of the food production increase around the world also came. By from increasing the area of agriculture, you know, especially in places like Brazil and Indonesia, Indonesia, we cleared a large amount of forest land to put agricultural land for oil palm or soybean and things of the crops of that nature. But we don't have that luxury anymore, and we shouldn't be clearing our forest to grow more food. But the only way we can feed the ever increasing population is to see how we can grow more food with the existing farm lands. And we would need every 
trick in our toolbox to be able to do so. Uh, it's going to take new, new varieties of crops in genetic engineering. It's going to take very smart um, precision farming tools so we don't have to be using too much fertilizer or pesticides and uh, we'll probably new automation. There are already farmers in Australia and France are using drones on the farm and there's robots going to be used on the farm. So uh, I see the big data is something uh, being used. Monsanto has bought a company for $1 billion called Climate Corporation, where they, where they use a lot of data into making our agriculture more smarter. And so I would think moving forward, we would need every science innovation that we can put our hands on. And biotechnology is going to be one important component in that so that we can help feed the world, not only to make sure that all, uh, everyone is, uh, has good amount of food, but also nutritional food, but we also grow that in a manner that is not as destructive to the environment as some of the agriculture has been in the recent past. On that note, what, what about the idea of uh, uh, plants that can grow in, say, the desert. Is that possible? Absolutely. That, um, you, yeah, as you see, you do, that's a very important uh, component, part of uh, our research and trying to develop crop plants that are uh, that help withstand uh, periods of drought. Because you do, even in the, uh, the toughest deserts, such as, uh, you know, in, in Kalahari Desert, and in many of the Saharan desert, you do find some trees, trees growing there, right? Yeah. And so there are, we are learning from how some of these plants can grow in the in very, very water deprived uh, areas. And by transferring genes from some of those plants into our crop plants, we may not be able to, you know, grow them in full desert like uh, what you're visualizing, but clearly uh, we can make them more drought tolerant, at least in the near term. And, uh, and not only making them drought tolerant, there's also need to make them heat tolerant with the increasing temperature. And also because of the increasing sea level, a lot of our crop plants are going to be selenized. There's salt, salt Ooh, water yeah. is going to creep in. So we need to bring in a greater level of salt tolerance and even submergence tolerance because a lot of rivers are going to rise and many of the crop paddies in Asia are going to be submerged. And so we need to come up with technologies to see how we can bring in submerged flooding tolerance into our crop plants too. And again, genetic technologies would help us go that way. Okay, everyone, uh, we're coming up for the final two minutes. I think we can start to wrap it up there. I'll uh, quick go around the panel for your final thoughts, Marty. Yeah, I'm going to say the same thing I say every time someone comes <laughs> along to talk about biotechnology or, or anything in in that sort of area. I think this is really important stuff. I wish I knew more about it. Uh, so it's always very interesting to have someone come along who knows what they're talking about about that. Because kids, kids doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ah, uh, don't know. No kids. What do you have to say? Screw you, Marty. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Um, yeah, no, it, it was brilliant. To, to, it's great. To, to major appreciation to our guests today for coming on. It was brilliant. Um, yeah. All right. And Pumpkin. Um, I showed up late. I didn't have a clue what was being talked about when I arrived. <laughs> I may have learned a few things. But um, please, uh, the next time you're talking to the Irish, don't, don't mention the potatoes. It, it scares us. <laughs> uh, it scares us too much. I'm sorry, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Prakash, um, if people listening to this, if they want to get in touch with you with further questions or if they just want to reach you in general, how would they do that? Oh, as you know, I'm on the Twitter and the Facebook, but my handle is AgBioWorld, A-G-B-I-O-W-O-R-L-D. Um, they can easily contact me through a direct message on Twitter or they could just send me an email prakashcs1 at gmail.com yeah. Right and uh, we also give our guests like, any last message or any last thoughts you have yourself 
Oh, myself. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share share my thoughts with the very broad uh, uh, public base you have. And the way I look at it is, you know, biotechnology. The the public skepticism of this technology is very natural when you look at the history of food. Many of the food technologies have been resisted and opposed. Uh, Italy is so famous for tomatoes. Believe it or not, they had banned tomatoes for about 100 years. When pasteurization came about, uh, it was took more than 100 years for it to be adapted. And so a lot of technologies related to food take have tend to be resisted in the beginning by the public. But down the road, when their society recognizes some of these new innovations, they're helpful and they are very beneficial, but they don't have the kind of risk that they thought out to be, they would eventually turn around and accept it. I don't believe GMOs controversy will go away uh, down the road and that you're going to see great acceptance of it everywhere. So in about 80 years that the world is on fire, <laughs> <laughs> Everything will be perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for turning out and uh, chatting with me. If you show your appreciation for Dr. Prakash, thumbs up. We've all, th <coughs> excuse me, thoroughly enjoyed this. Excuse me, I'm coughing there. <coughs> uh, next week, we're back in two weeks. Our special guest is Concordance, which I'm sure many of you are all aware about. Uh, we'll be talking about viruses and health scares. Um, Kitch, you, well, we, we don't really need a massive introduction, but you give us a rundown of concordance. Uh, he's, um, he's, a skeptic, he's a science skeptic YouTuber, um, does a lot of videos on various scientific topics such as AIDS denialism, um, various medical health pseudoscience claims, and I think he's also on the Magic Sandwich show. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, all around terrific, absolutely just just terrific person all around. Yeah. Um, makes really interesting videos. Yeah, like I said we. I think for uh, the audience, we don't really need to say much more. But we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> and we'll see everyone in two weeks. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone, and have a good weekend. Thank hey, yourself. Thank you. It's hip to be a hipster Cool to be a hipster Shit if you're not hipster So hip to be a hipster